intensely jealous that, you know, this person got that picture and wondered how they did it and they would tell me there was a there was a great um, camaraderie around how difficult the job was to do and how much we loved to do it and a terrific sharing because we had enormous respect for each other. So when Lou Jones, you know, when I needed something and Lou Jones was in the commercial world and I wanted to shoot something with lights that I didn't know anything about, I'd call Lou and if I had to shoot something that wasn't a person, uh, I knew I could ask Bob Caputo, you know, how the hell do you get up close to these things? I, I wanna go back to your question about paying people too. I just have a quick story for you, which is twice, there's two stories that came to mind. One was, um, one was uh, I was photographing in Peru. I'm sorry, I don't have a picture here to show you, but I was photographing in Peru and uh, we went into a village. It was a story I was doing about the history of wool for the National Geographic. And I wanted to photograph weavers in a small village near Arequipa. And uh, when I went there, um, the head guy came up to me, he said, um, you can photograph anything you want here as long as um, you pay to have a bread oven built. And um, that sort of took me aback, but you know, it's a, it's a heavily touristed area. So, you know, he was a good negotiator. And I said, well, how much is a bread oven? And he told me what it was and it was $8. So I agreed to it and I got quite a few good days of shooting and they got a bread oven so they didn't have to walk so far uh, to get their bread baked. Only one carry for $8? Uh, $8. Yeah, you wow. couldn't have done two? Right, and the other, the other one was um, in Panama, um, we were going around to the San Blas Islands. And again, I had to go see a chief there to get permission to go to each island. And we had to have permission to go to every island. And he said, you can photograph on permission that you pay the islands $1 per person you photograph. And um, I agreed to that too. Uh, and that, that's the only two times that I can remember actually paying wasn't nobody ever asked me for money directly except in Egypt everyone asked me for money all the time every day that I was shooting and um, did, did, you, did you pay except for Egypt except for Egypt Egypt everyone that's, asked me, asked me for money all the time. that was the reason why I asked the question everybody when I was in Egypt everybody asked for money yeah I think it's the, it's the tourism I mean it's just it's it's like I did a story about the Nile River and I went, I started at the mouth of the river in the Mediterranean. I drove down through Egypt and then I went into Sudan and then kept going to the source of the Nile. And once I crossed into Sudan from Egypt, it was a whole different world. You know, it was just, they didn't have, they don't have that sort of mega tourism. I just want to say one other thing about uh, paying people. I, the feeling I have is that if I'm doing a, a photograph of somebody who's aware that I'm making a photograph of them, um, the photograph is a record of my relationship with them. And if they're happy and comfortable, I think it shows. And if they're not happy and uncomfortable, it's not a good picture anyway. So, you know, if, if people mind having their photo, if you haven't developed, even spent a little bit of time developing some kind of relationship with people, you're not, it's, it's hard to get a good picture. Of course, you can't do that. I mean, if you're street shooting and just catching things as they go by, of course you can't do that. But if you're one-on-one -on -one with somebody, I, the, the, I don't, I don't take the camera out right away. I spent, I try to spend a little time with people and, you know, joke around, whatever. Um, just to form at least some tiny little bit of a relationship that can be reflected in the image. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna get to the baby with the snake in a minute, but Rebecca asked about the frogs with the clothespin. So can you find that one, Bob? Uh, th this was an assignment. Um, from the National Geographic, which was, uh, which was, it was called uh, a harsh awakening. It was about Australia, and it was about the fact that um, Australia has a very unique climate and a unique geology. And um, when Western settlers came to Australia, they had no idea. They had, they were using Western farming techniques, and they wanted me to do a story on how. Uh, traditional farming had really 
become an environmental disaster. And um, along the way, I was driving one day and I saw this scene of all these toads with clothespins and, you know, drove the car off the road to see what was going on. And um, what I discovered was that along with other types of environmental disasters in Australia, um, what was happening was that uh, for years and years, they were growing sugar cane and they had a blight of uh, cane beetles and um, they couldn't figure out how to control them. And somebody came up with a bright idea of bringing in these uh, cane toads from the originally in South America. My understanding was that their last stop was in Hawaii. And there were, there were two problems. One was that there were no natural predators. And the other was that the cane beetles tended to attack the top of the cane and the, and the toads were at the bottom of the cane. So they never actually saw each other. But these had no predators, and they just be, became an enormous problem. And uh, there would be thousands and thousands of these during breeding, breeding season out on the road. And there was a taxidermist who discovered that Japanese tourists would like to uh, buy them and have them mounted. It started with uh, somebody asked to have one of these toads put on the wedding cake. <laughs> one, one stuffed as, as the male and one stuffed as the female, and they put it in a storefront. And this started a craze. And this guy uh, ended up every year collecting, he, he would pay kids uh, to collect the toads, and then he would euthanize them and uh, skin them and stuff them with uh, plaster and the clothespins there to keep the plaster in. And then he'd set them out to dry and I, often he would pose them. So that's what this picture is about. It didn't completely fit my theme of my story, but everybody <laughs> loved it and it ran anyway. Okay, your turn, Bob. Now do baby and the snake. Do baby and the snake, okay. All right, this was for a story. I got two stories from the National Geographic. When I was doing a lot of stories that, um, that, were, that were international coverages and they were sort of cerebral, um, they, they gave me a story that was called the, 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 the mind is what the brain does. And I got very, very interested in brain studies and mind studies. And one of the things that I became interested in was the idea uh, that researchers were working on was, are we born with a fear of snakes? Is it hardwired or is it something we learn? And um, it turned out it was actually a little bit of both. We have some genetic propensity to have a fear of snakes, but it has to be turned on. It has to be taught. And um, so I was like, well, how can I illustrate this? And I had been working in Australia a lot, and I knew a guy, uh, his name was Rex, and he ran a reptile center in Alice Springs. And he had a pet snake that he had raised from an egg by the name of Ollie. And it was a 13 foot olive python. And so we called him up and asked him um, if we could you know, if it would be safe to photograph his snake with a baby lying in the coil. And oh yeah, he thought this was a great idea. And then of course, the next question was who would be insane enough to offer their baby to lie in this coil. So uh, he said he knew someone who would do that too. And he had a very good friend who had recently had a baby. And she said she knew Ollie really well. She had known him ever since she was in school because he Rex would bring the snake to school and let the kids play with it. In fact, what they would do is all the kids would lie down and uh, on the floor next to each other. And then he'd let the, the snake go loose and it would wiggle over their bellies and they'd all scream. And anyway, so she trusted the snake. The snake was very well fed. It was went middle of winter in, in uh, Alice Springs. And the snake was also very cold. So they brought the snake, Ollie, out of the box and put him in a coil on the couch. And then the baby was just waking up and had been bundled. So the baby was really hot. 
we set the baby down on the snake, which was ice cold, and uh, and the and and the little boy peed immediately, and the snake uh, went looking for the hottest spot there was, which was the baby's forehead, and I got one frame, and it was magic, and we got lots and lots of hate mail at the National Geographic about this picture. One woman wrote saying, "What are you going to do next? Throw babies to lions," and um, that's the story of the snake and baby. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome Mom. Becky, oh, sorry I was just going to say Becky also asked about this image uh, of Carrie's all right so this this was for a story for National Geographic which was about um, Sichuan province, which had, <clears throat> Sichuan was the first province to open after the Cultural Revolution. And I went in there for several months. And one of the things they wanted to show me was this magnificent area, which was, which is called Jozai Go in, uh, in the mountains. And uh, at the time, it was very remote. In fact, it took us days to get there we were driving up what seemed like stream beds. We were delayed by rocks, rock slides. And um, it just was a very difficult place. And I had met a photographer in Chengdu who was the father of my guide uh, on another story. And he told me about this waterfall where there is uh, a lot of calcification in the water that makes the bottom of the, the, the bottom of the stream very, very rough. It's like walking on sandpaper. And um, he told me that there are a lot of Tibetans villages in that area and that they, they cross the waterfall on horseback in order to, to go to market. So we went there and I couldn't find a view of this thing um, because uh, you, you, everyone would see it from the top or they'd see it from the bottom and I wanted to be above it. And there was a mountain across from it. And I talked to some of the local loggers and they said, oh, you can see it from that mountain. So we actually waited and waited and no one ever came. So I started going to the villages and finding out if anyone ever did ride across the waterfall. And they said, yeah, you're just here on the wrong day. You have to go there on market day. You have to know what, you know, what day it is. So I think it was a Monday morning <clears throat> and they said they would definitely be going to market. And uh, we climbed the mountain. And when I got up there, I could, I could hear the waterfall, but I couldn't see it because there were big, big trees and there was a lot of foliage. So the guys that were with me fashioned a rope swing and uh, they climbed up a tree and then they hauled me up with my cameras on this rope swing into the trees so that I would have a, a view through the limbs. And sure enough, uh, we got these Tibetan horsemen on their way to market. And um, just a few years ago, there, you probably had heard that there was a major earthquake in, uh, in Sichuan and this entire waterfall collapsed along with lots and lots of that area. So this is gone. But right before that, and in, in the intervening time, since, you know, from the time I was there and it was difficult to get there, uh, they opened it as a national park. There were major international hotels built all around it. There was a huge airport put in and restaurants and all sorts of things. And um, so it's, it's one of those pictures that preserves a moment that um, is completely gone, just completely gone. Your turn. I, I will come back to uh, talk about what was the other one. Uh, I think you got it. I got all three. It's your turn, Bob. Let's get on to something. Anybody have any questions? Well, Bob, yeah. I'll ask you about this one. Uh, okay, this was uh, Murchison Falls National Park in, um, in Uganda. And it was. Um, while I was doing a story about the Nile and um, Idi Amin had, had just been driven out of Uganda and his retreating troops had massacred everything they could find in the national parks. Um, and not, I mean, they, they, they shot, this is 
probably almost all of the elephants that were left in Murchison Falls National Park at the end of that. They were shooting everything and they would go, you know, they like the lodge I went to stay in had been, you know, they'd torn everything movable, the sinks and the faucets and the electrical wires and they'd blown up one wing of the hotel with a mortar and they just had, I mean, it was just really horrible. <clears throat> and um, there's an, a wonderful guy named Ian Douglas Hamilton, who's a sort of lifelong elephant expert and a uh, conservationist who had a small plane, a Cessna. Um, and by the way, if you ever want to do aerial photography, overhead wings are really important <laughs> because you can either, and a, a small, a really small single engine uh, can usually go really slowly. So you don't have, you don't have to use a ridiculously high uh, shutter speed. Um, so we took the passenger door off and uh, it was overhead wing and we flew around like for hours until we found, finally found this, um, image uh, of this of this herd and the egrets sort of taking off in the opposite direction, um, and it's it then was turned into the cover of the um, Planet Earth BBC book. <laughs> Bob, tell us a little bit about that Nile trip. That's epic. Well, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> I started at, as I said at the mouth of the river, and it took me I think seven months. The, the actual farthest south source of the Nile, the thing that makes it the longest river in the world, is a tiny little spring in Burundi on the side of a hill. Um, and I, you know, I went through Egypt. And like you were saying, you know, Egypt was just, it was really a hassle making photographs. The, the good thing was I had my own car. And the main road that sort of goes along the Nile, I mean, everybody knows, you know, there's the Nile and then there are sort of fields on the banks and then there's desert. And usually the road was the sort of line between the desert and the fields. Um, and on the main road, there were at every, every time a, a road would turn off it to go towards the river, there was a great big sign that said, no foreigners allowed. Um, so of course I ignored it. And I discovered pretty quickly that the local policeman was you know, quite happy. Now, I, I didn't pay people for um, pictures, but I have often paid people to get permission to make pictures. <laughs> to not get arrested. Um, so um, I found once you got away from the tourist centers in Egypt, the people were just, you know, like ordinary people everywhere, incredibly hospitable and friendly and wonderful and, and all that. And then it was, you know, through Northern Sudan, Southern Sudan. Um, and then I got to Uganda and I actually, I, I went straight for, a, there was a big hassle at the, at the border coming into Uganda because the soldiers were drunk and they had guns and, they took everything out of my car and it was sort of a nightmare. Um, and I just wasn't in a mood. So I made straight for the national park and I turned on my little shortwave radio that night and heard uh, that there um, were reports of, of uh, genocide coming out of Uganda and that, that the um, 200 people in, a, in a, um, a displaced persons camp had been killed and uh, people in men in, in began the army uniforms were seen dumping 50 bodies into a mass grave. And I thought, what the hell am I doing here? <laughs> um, so anyway, so then, it, you know, so then it was all the way through Uganda and Uganda is where like, it's a single river until it gets into Uganda and then it splits up into Lake Victoria and Lake George and Lake Albert. And, uh, you know, suddenly it's a whole bunch of things. Um, so there was a lot to cover, like the climbing the mountains of the moon, the ruins stories, which are, also a source of the Nile. And it's, it's really amazing. I mean, right on the equator, there are these uh, six peaks over 15,000 feet, the highest ones almost 17,000 feet. And so they're glaciers like on the equator, which is the first um, European explorers who reported on these, there's Mount Kilimanjaro, Mount Kenya, and the Ruanzori's all have glaciers. And the first one that reported on, on Kilimanjaro, everybody in Europe thought, oh, this guy's been out in the sun too long. Can't possibly be, be glaciers on the equator. Um, and then through Rwanda and Burundi and <laughs> the whole time I was doing this trip, I had this, cause I was headed for the source and, uh, I, I had this sort of fantasy about it and I thought it would be this, you know, beautiful little, the spring bubbling up in a little glade with, you know, colorful jacaranda trees and, and, um, and, you know, flowers all around it and all that sort of stuff. And I got to this hill in Burundi and there was a little pyramid at the top of it that had been put up by some Belgian guy in 1938 that said source of the Nile in Latin. Um, so I sort of drove up to that and then looked around and I saw where a stream sort of left that, that hill and went north. 
So I, I ran around to where it was and there was, a, <laughs> there was a, a cement block with a little uh, two inch lead pipe coming out of it that was dripping into a place that was all fouled with goat dung and stuff. That's the romantic source of the money. <laughs> That's also the romantic story that goes with so many pictures that never happen. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. You imagine what's going to be there and it just ain't. It ain't. No, it ain't there. And, but the, the thing is that almost always, and this is, I mean, I think, and it's only because I'm such a lousy photographer, but I think the, the, the best thing about National Geographic was that they, we essentially didn't have budgets of time or money. It was like, take whatever you need to get the story done. And there were times like when I did a story about the Congo River and it took me six weeks to get a photo permit. I'm staying in the Intercontinental Hotel. I'm spending a ton of money. I'm going to the you know, Ministry of Information every day and the security people and all this, man and all this sort of stuff. And there's no other magazine, there wasn't any publication in the world that would have, have done that. You know, because I was spending a lot of money and getting nothing. Uh, but in the end, because of perseverance and, and, uh, and also figuring out um, how to do it, we managed to get photographs of something that never been photographed before. So, yeah, I think it was worth it. But the time is, time is the, I think, is the main ingredient. That, that was the, it was the sort of the thing that made Geographic different from everybody else. Because uh -huh. without the time, you can't, you can't, you know, you go someplace and if the weather's lousy, what are you going to do? Well, if, if you worked for Geographic in those days, you could wait. As long as you didn't get thrown out of the country. Exactly. You don't no. uh, <laughs> could you explain this one, what this was from? Yeah, this, <clears throat> excuse me. This is a story I did in Suriname, <laughs> which has a very um, large Muslim population. And all these women were out uh, at this sort of festival. And I was sort of walking around. Of course, I started like the idiot I am. I started on the side, side with the sun was shining on their faces. And I took pictures there and then I, I walked around the back and I went, oh my God, this looks a lot better when it's backlit. Mm. And then it did just happened to be this gap with this little girl sitting in it. And so it was, you know, I, couldn't, I couldn't help myself. Were there other children there? No, that's the only, well, it's not in among them. That was the only one I saw in among them. Uh -huh. And it may be that there were others I just couldn't see. But luckily, this this was sort of the last row in the back. So um, you got lucky, my friend. Absolutely. Well, luck is you know I I swear to God, without serendipity, I'd be nothing. <laughs> mm -hmm. I pray to her every day. Can you just tell us the story about the cheetah pictures? Yeah, uh, those that mother and her cub. Um, cheetahs usually give birth to like three or four cubs, and they're lucky if if one survives usually because lions, hyenas, wild dogs, anything that can catch him will kill him. Um, and I found this mother and her cub and I stayed with them for a week because uh, this is in the national parks in Kenya and Tanzania, the, the animals are really used to cars because they're of the tourism. So you can drive up to them in a car and get really close. I think this was a 300 millimeter lens. Um, and they don't mind a bit, they just ignore you. Um, because they, they're just used to seeing cars all the time. Um, but I knew that if I, if I left her, it would be really, once, if they went into a thicket or tall grass, or so, I'd just never find them again. So I just slept near them and stayed with them all the time. And um, I got a lot of amazing pictures of her, but it's only because, like I was saying before, about time. You know, I, I could just spend a week with this one cheetah and her baby um, and not say, you know, I've got to, I've got to get this done this afternoon because tomorrow I got to go somewhere else to do something else. Um, and because especially wildlife photography is just all about time and patience. I mean, there's no, to keep myself um, from going insane. I, before I did this, I had worked in a uh, art house movie theater in California and I'd made audio tapes of all the classic movies that we showed there. And because I, if I read a book, I might miss something. But by having these movies on cassettes, I could watch the animals and still, you know, not go out of my mind. <laughs> what was your favorite movie? 
Well, all of it, it's really weird. Like, there's Casablanca. I mean, there's all that kind of stuff, you know? And I just, I mean, it's like, it's in, all in my head. The, everything, the dialogue, the music, the, you know, it's just, it's ridiculous. <laughs> Here's looking at you, kid. You probably, you probably know line by line some of those movies. I know all of them. I mean, yeah, all of them. I know them line by line because I heard them, you know, gazillion times. But, Kara, I got to ask you about that first picture of yours because I still don't know what that is. Which one? The very first picture. Oh, okay. That's back in Australia. This is an aerial view of salt skulls, which is down around Esperance, which is in the Bight of Australia. So I got to give you a little geological history here. Uh, Australia was once part of an enormous landmass called Gondwana, and um, it, it broke off and started heading north. And one of the things that happened was it really never got glaciated like the rest of the world did. Uh, it was always just sort of out of reach. Uh, and it had been nearly at the South Pole where it was a very wet rainforest. And as it headed north, it dried out and dried out and dried out. But as all of that water, seawater, got swallowed up in ice, the sea became much, much saltier. And the winds were blowing salt over the continent of Australia and laid down a thick layer of salt. And then over the billions of years, one geologist said to me about Australia, you're now standing on a place where nothing has happened for three billion years, and, uh, except erosion. And, um, uh, but Australia has a particular pr problem, and that is that that layer of salt is covered with um, some clay, uh, and it's covered with a layer of sand, which is really the soil. And the farmer who was working this land was telling me, if you make one mistake, if you puncture there's the fresh water is in that top layer. There's an aquifer in that top layer. But if you puncture that clay layer, the salt water from below uh, comes up and destroys the land, possibly forever. And so you can see a little here, especially on the right, there's plowed fields and you can see some scraping at fields in between. But those areas that have um, the colors. Those are salt ponds where the water has leaked up through and uh, there's algae that gets in there. And each type of algae, depending on its life cycle, uh, displays a different color. So uh, I thought it was a marvelous abstraction. Mm. We've got lots and lots of these pictures of these salt skulls. But that, that really is the major crisis in Australia is um, first desert desertification and then um, this salt coming up through. And in the wheat belts of Australia, um, they're planting native plants like crazy where only one generation ago they had been stripping the land of native plants and putting in wheat. Whole families are out planting salt tolerant species to try to hold on to their land. This is just a very dramatic example of that. Yeah, it's an awesome picture. I like it too, thank you. Anybody else want us to talk about a picture or have a question? Is there well, anyone, anybody left? Oh, I think we still have quite a few, but okay. I, I have a question, Carrie. you had told me about this one and uh, I found that really quite interesting. Now that, that's somebody who doesn't want their picture taken. <laughs> well, you're right. <laughs> and in fact, he was quite adamant about it. Um, the, the story, this was another one of those stories like, what, what, what the hell am I going to do with this? It was like the history of writing was one of those stories that was sort of drifting around. And um, I got a call from the director of photography and he said, nobody wants this. Do you want it? I mean, nobody knows what the photograph. So I said, well, that sounds like a cool project, actually. And so one of the things I got interested in were the Dead Sea Scrolls in Israel and uh, the history of writing Torah, which is um, the scrolls, uh, it's, it's Jewish law 
uh, written on scrolls that you find in any synagogue. And um, it's, it's rolls and rolls of parchment. And I got curious in how the parchment was made. Actually, what I was photographing was the people who write on the parchment. But while when I was seeing it, I got interested in how it was made. So I asked the guy who was helping me if he would take me to a place where they made the parchment. And, um, you know, the phone call went well, and we thought we were going to get in. And when I got there, the guy who ran the place came out and he said, I changed my mind. I don't want you to come in because you'll steal my secrets. So I, you know, I suddenly had visions of myself starting a parchment factory using, <laughs> using his secrets. So I was very disappointed, really disappointed. And he saw my disappointment and he said, well, what I can do is I'll go in and I'll get one of the skins. So these are, these are, uh, the skins of unborn calves, um, and that's traditional, uh, that are used for Torah, and um, that are cleaned and scraped and dried and treated. Uh, this is, so he said he'd go in and get one and show it to me, and he came out, and uh, the, the, whatever the chemical he was using on it had turned it blue and he held it up against a blue background where I'm guessing probably they do some spraying or something. And I got this really amazing kind of abstract image. And of course he didn't want to be photographed. And Bob, if you're, if you can see the, the picture next to it is of the reclining woman. You see that? Uh, let, I will find that. Oh, I'm so, here we go. Yes. Okay, so this was for the same story. And I got very interested in the history of hieroglyphs. Um, and especially interested in Campolian, who was the person who discovered how to decode hieroglyphs using the Rosetta Stone. And I won't go into that in detail unless somebody's really dying to know. Um, but what he discovered was that hieroglyphs uh, are, are not pictograms. They are a combination of pictures that have meaning, but are also phonetic. And so I wanted to show how one worked. And um, this, is a, this is a sentence, and um, you can read it from left to right. And the first, the first word is I. And um, if you, if you, I don't know if it's big enough for you to see it, but if you can read this, you could take a shot at it. Um, oh, that's good. So start with her eye. And who wants to volunteer to try it? Must be someone. And if you already know the answer, don't be the volunteer. <laughs> I did, but I forgot. Okay. I actually remembered suddenly. <laughs> Anybody? I'll try it, Bob. So it starts with I, and then go to the, the jewelry. Which Bob? Either one. Well, I know it. I'm, I'm going to keep my mouth shut. Okay. I believe. That's right. And that's what's next. Uh, I. Yes. Can. Yes. And then you go up. You have to realize what kind of plant grows along the Nile. Uh, since somebody traveled it, I need a little Palm? hint. Palm. You know, you're close. Think think about um, think about the types of plants. Think about Moses. Think about Moses. There you go. <laughs> okay. Or what the Egyptians wrote on. There you go. Oh, papyrus. I believe I can read. It's a read. Read. Yes. Ah. What is it? I need help. Come on. I think I can read. Read. What is that thing? A ball? Well, what else could it be? 
Plato. Yes, this thank is you. A black or a plate. <laughs> I believe I can read Plato. And there's the toe. So that, that's exactly how hieroglyphs work. In fact, um, the, um, the first time I ever saw the statue of Ramses as a child, there's all these strange symbols on it, but it turns out it's a sentence. It, you know, it's in the Egyptian museum. Yeah. And um, it's, it's a combination of images and, um, and sounds. So uh, this also ran in the National Geographic. And I remember a 12 year old boy wrote in and said, this is too easy, try something difficult. <laughs> But speaking of difficult, explain how you did that. Oh, well, so at the time I was a big fan of David Hockney's work as a photographer and an artist. And he does these things called joiners where he's photographing things from different sides and getting a very much like a cubist approach to what the images look like. So I got fascinated with that. And what I did was I photographed this uh, on, on print film that I would then take to the drugstore and have processed into little, I don't know if they were three by five, four by five prints. And this is, I think there are 400 or 500 prints here that um, I glued down to a board. But there was a great mystery that evolved while this happened. I was staying in a hotel room and I had two banquet tables bought to the hotel room where I could lay out the pictures when I got them from the printer to see if it was working. And um, what I would do is lay them out and uh, you know, sort of get them where I wanted them to be. And then when I'd come back at the end of the day, they had all moved. And you know, I had put up tape everywhere. It said, you know, do not enter. And nobody, it was clear to me nobody had entered the room. And I was like, you know, there was no wind, there was no windows open. And every day, the same thing would happen. I'd put them all back, I'd go out for the day and come back and they'd all move. And then one day I did it, I put them all out. And then I got on the phone for a while and uh, it was after I had showered and I, the room had taken some of the moisture uh, in, in the atmosphere and all of the prints had curled and they, when they dried, they all walked across the table. So that, that solved that mystery. But I never glued them down until I got home. And luckily, my wife, who's a graphic designer, made some sense of this and made this amazing uh, combination. Uh, and it's, um, it's a four by eight foot print. And Lou Jones made the final photograph of the photograph that went in the, in the National Geographic. It, it reminds me of a Sue Anthony's work, her collages. Yes, it does. That's right. <laughs> the first thing I thought of when I saw it. Um, it t another question for you. What was the, um, your least favorite project and your most favorite? Uh, be great for both of you. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I don't... I don't actually have a, I loved all of them. I mean, maybe not at the time. <laughs> okay, let me rephrase that. How about least, most difficult? Oh, the most difficult. Uh, oh, I did a story about the Horn of Africa, um, where there's pictures from Somalia, and that's where that cover is from. Um, yeah. And that was just, I mean, that was really, that was in the, in the, uh, in the 90s when, the, the sort of anarchy when Somalia was just falling apart is sort of Black Hawk Town time. And I went before the, um, before the Marines went in and I went back after the Marines had gone in. And it was just, I mean, like that, that technical that you saw there, they were the, the guys with the, the gangs controlled everything. It was all, even Mogadishu was split up into neighborhoods. And I, um, on my way there, I stopped. The only way you could get to, to Somalia in those days was to fly in on some kind of aid plane <clears throat> from Nairobi. And I was staying in a hotel in Nairobi and I was having really horrible nightmares and I couldn't sleep and I couldn't figure out what it was. And I thought it was just because, I thought it was because I was going to Somalia. And it turned out that I was taking this malaria medicine that's really powerful and that was the cause of it. <clears throat> but then I got there. Well, here's this. 
a story that I, I learned a lot from. I, I showed up at the, there's an airport in Nairobi for small planes, and then there's the big international airport. I went to the one for small planes, and um, there was a Red Cross plane there with a uh, Belgian doctor and a French nurse, and one seat, and the rest of it was just full of, of medicine. And I was standing there on the tarmac, and I looked down, and I had three cases. So between me and the three cases, probably, I don't know, 300 pounds of medicine wasn't going that day. And I thought, I hope I can live up to this. Um, so I flew in, and I was staying with the Red Cross in Mogadishu, and they got a car for me. Um, they arranged a car for me and the car showed up and there was a driver. There were two guys sitting in the back with AK-47s and a guy sitting on the roof with one of those machine guns, like in that picture, just for me. I had my own little army. And if I was going to another part of Mogadishu, that car would drive up to an invisible green line and another car would come from the other side. And I had to run from one car to the other because if the car I was in went into that neighborhood, they'd be shot at. So it was... It was just, it was a nightmare. I mean, you know, mortars are going off and, and I was the only, there was this house that, that was uh, sort of turned into a place that journalists could stay and I was the only one there. Um, and, you know, you hear mortars and gunfire all the time and I was scared witless, basically, most of the time I was there. But it was one of those things that I, the, the concept of the story, because it was in the national news all the time, Somalia was. And so... I had this idea to do a story about the whole Horn of Africa, um, Somalia and Sudan and Ethiopia. Because I was just, I mean, we all, Africa suffers from this sort of donor fatigue thing, you know, where it's just always horrible stories coming out of there. And I wanted to show what was going on in Somalia. And we, of course we couldn't compete with the news magazines and stuff. But, um, but also I wanted to show what was going on in Sudan, which was actually worse than what was going on in Somalia, but nobody was paying any attention to it. And, then I wanted to include Ethiopia because they'd gone through that uh, horrible famine in 1984. And once the political situation was sorted out, then, you know, people were back, they were growing food in those places where they'd been starving to death. And it, the idea was to try to give people some idea that th these things are not necessarily endless and hopeless. So that was sort of why I did that. that. That was the most difficult one. And in some ways it's the one I was, you know, it's sort of, I felt good about doing that story because I hope, hope it, you know, it showed, I, the kind of places I was always working were usually places that people here don't really know anything, know, know very much about. And I always thought it was my job to, to show them. <laughs> Be their eyes and ears for them, you know, people who couldn't get there themselves. How about you, Carrie? Um, well, the hardest one was one that never happened because I couldn't make it happen. That was a story about Aboriginals in Australia. I'd been working in Australia a lot, really a lot, and became very, very interested in doing something on the Australian Aboriginal population there and became quite friendly with a few people in the community. And they did their best to try to help me, but essentially the- I don't know if you can hear me. The sound is breaking up for me. Uh, uh, I don't know. How about now? I don't know if it's my computer. You tell me, come back on and tell me if you're still having problems. Um, I would go around to these communities and, and basically ask for permission to photograph because you had to have permission to enter these communities. And um, I remember one meeting I went to, I had to fly a small plane in to get to this community. And they told me they had gathered the community for me to talk to. And um, the setup was this. We had to walk quite a way from the little town out into the bush. And there was a table there and a loudspeaker. And it was unbelievably hot. And apparently the people who I was talking to were out, the, out there. I could see some of them. But, you know, just out sitting under a bush or wherever. And, um, and I was making my pitch not in their language so it was I had an interpreter and um, you know the hopelessness of the situation it was like you want to do what and why should we let you do that and um, you know it was 
I felt like, um, as Bob was saying, if you if you want to build a relationship, you got, you got to be close to people and you got to get to know each other. A lot of these people were hundreds of feet away from me and I couldn't even see them and I never met them. So, you know, I went back to my airplane and flew away. I went back actually after months of trying in the net in, in Australia to get a community that would help me. Uh, others have done very good job with this. People who've just, you know, made a career of building a relationship with a community have done some really beautiful work on that community. But that was, it was not only the hardest, it never happened. Uh, I think in terms of favorites, um, I like working in India and I like working in Australia. I, I worked early on in China when it first opened and in Russia, I spent a lot of time there. But uh, in the course of doing that, I got um, very interested in the subject of textiles. My wife had suggested we do a story on silk and I did a story that turned out to be just amazing. It was, it was in China and Japan and on the Silk Road and uh, and there was a lot of resistance on the part of the geographic. There were mostly male editors and that had mostly a male audience. And uh, my wife Babs had approached the editor during a uh, Christmas party and said, why, why aren't you interested in silk? And um, he, he couldn't even remember getting the proposal, even though I had submitted it umpteen times over two years. And uh, she said, well, you're missing, you know, a, a big potential audience, people who would be interested in this sort of thing. So he gave me the assignment and it turned out to be the most popular story of the year. And they ran 52 pages in the magazine, which was my all time record. And then immediately they came back and said, do another story on textiles. So I ended up doing multiple, I did silk and wool and cotton. And, um, but in all of those stories, the one thing that I fell in love with was the story of color. And I did do a story about color that uh, that it was it was just the sort of vehicle to get me into um, the kinds of stories that I love to do, but also to reveal cultures. This is uh, one of the pictures in a series of pictures that I've made really over the years in India uh, during the festival of Holi. And the story of Holi is a wonderful one. It's a love story between um, the Indian god Radha, who falls in love with a gopi, who's a cowgirl. And, um, and they had such a big love that everywhere they went, people would th throw colored flower petals on them, or so, so the story goes. And every year in April, it's a spring celebration, an agrarian spring celebration. Um, there, you can still find places where they throw flower petals, but for the most part, people throw colored powder or, or colored water. And from dawn until about noon, um, you can, you, it's a free for all. Anybody can throw powder and color on anybody else and it doesn't matter who you are. <laughs> And um, that, just go back to that picture, Bob, of the women. That, that was shot at the Baldev Temple in a place called Mathura, which is, is, was uh, supposed to be the home story. That's where the home of the story. In a temple where they gather for this and huge numbers of people come in, into this courtyard and people are above them with bags of colored powder or water on balconies and they throw it down on them. And uh, there was a local photographer who helped me. She said, if you go in there, they will destroy your cameras with color and with water. You will just become the best target. So I said, well, what do I do? She said, well, I'm gonna help you. So she dressed me up as a woman and I had <laughs> layers and layers of saris on and I had my cameras buried inside of all of these textiles. And uh, for the longest time, nobody discovered me. And then a little kid did discover me and they did ruin my cameras, not, <laughs> not before I got this photograph. Do you have a picture of you in drag? 
I do, but not from this particular scene. Oh, okay. <laughs> um. <laughs> I was going to ask you that, how you protect your camera. The, the answer is so much better than I expected. <laughs> uh, so just go, go through those very quickly, Bob, the, the others in that series. There's the one, the yellow one. That's in, that's in New Delhi. And that's mixing um, colored dye with corn flour. You could imagine what this stuff feels like. And then the next one is they're drying the corn flour on the roof of a building in New Delhi. And this one is a salesman selling huge bags. I mean, these are like enormous bags of colored powder that they used uh, to throw. And then you have that picture. And then finally, um, this is after this is after the event. All the streets are covered with color, and of course the cows are just roaming around. And I love the fact that the cow too had been a victim of getting covered with pink powder. So I call this the pink cow. Anybody else have any thoughts? Any questions? We're going to go for a few more minutes. So if you've got anything on your mind, this is the time. And just one thing for any of you, because this work, so much of it is iconic and uh, just absolutely beautiful. Just a little plug that the work is available. If you're interested in prints, you know, just reach out to me and, uh, We'll get you set up with uh, Carrier and or Bob for some of this imagery. And Bob Corn printed the, 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 these images for Bob Caputo and I, and they're available in his gallery. I'd just like to reinforce something Carrie said earlier, which was the atmosphere at Geographic, because when I first arrived there, I was really like all these, there were all these photographers there whose work I knew and I admired, and I was really dumbfounded to find that everybody was ridiculously generous with, I mean, if you were trying to figure something out, people would help you out. There was no, cause I'd, I'd been freelancing for time and the people like that, which is very competitive. Um, and I got, I sort of got put off of it because I was in Nairobi when Jomo Kenyatta died, who was the first president of Kenya. Um, and so he was lying in, in wait um, in his house and his family was behind him and there was gonna be an opportunity. And all these, I mean, there were, there were some photographers based in Nairobi that all the Fleet Street photographers came to cover the story. So there's a huge crowd of photographers waiting outside this door. And the idea was that they were gonna open the door and then people could take the pictures of the body lying there and the family behind. And when they opened the door, there was just this mad rush and people literally almost knocked his body off the table. And I thought to myself, there's one picture here <laughs> that could be a pool picture. I don't, I think I want to do something different because uh, with time I, I learned, I, I was able to, I flew around Africa a lot with the time bureau chief, but it was always to do political stories and we were almost always just going to the capital. And I just thought I want to see, you know, I'd rather do stories about the other parts of geographic, the sort of parts that aren't in the news all the time, the people who, who don't make it into magazines and newspapers. And Geographic was the only place that was going to do that. And the, the people there, I mean, Carrie and Bruce Dale, and I mean, I could go on and on, everybody was, I was really amazed at how generous everybody was. And, um, and thank you, Carrie. Thank you, Bob. You said two things that I, that um, you might just help people understand. One is what's a pool picture? Uh, it's a picture of a swimming pool. No. <laughs> it's where everybody just decides that there's going to be one camera. It, it, it can be like, you know, of a, of a news conference, a, a, a television camera, or a still camera. Because, you know, there's some events which there's really only one picture from. And one photographer takes the picture, and then everybody gets to use that picture. So that's what a pool picture is. And the other one was... Um when you were talking about the events you were photographing that were news, you mentioned that um, you couldn't compete with the news. Right. Can you just give them a little background on that? Well, just because geographics lead time is so long. I mean, I, 
from the time you finish a story until it can actually come out is, I think it was usually six months, wasn't it, Carrie? Six months. Yeah. Because, Minimum. you know, they had to, I mean, all the production and the printing 11 million or 12 million copies of it. And it was just, so there wasn't any way that we could sort of do things that were, you know, that the news, news magazines wouldn't be well ahead of and probably would, you know, often would be old news by the time our magazine came out. So we always had to kind of look for a slightly different angle on, on things, which is why that idea of doing the Horn of Africa rather than just Somalia, there wouldn't have been any point in doing a story about Somalia because everybody was doing stories about Somalia, but nobody was doing stories about Southern Sudan at the time, which was just amazing to me. And I think it was largely because Somalia just seemed easier to, to deal with because, you know, Sudan is complicated because it's Arab North, African South, and, you know, a long history of animosity and all that sort of stuff. Somalia was, actually, Somalia was really weird because when I was doing that stringing for time, all the major news bureaus had offices in, uh, in Nairobi to cover sub-Saharan Africa, except for South Africa, which was a separate being altogether. Um, but everybody thought that Somalia would be the one country that would be okay because everybody was Somali. And they were all almost entirely, I think 97% Muslim. So they'll be okay. They won't, you know, fall victim to this horrible tribalism and, you know, power grabs by dictators and all that sort of stuff. And so when I got there and I was talking to my driver, who was a really nice guy, about this, and I said, you know, we all thought that Somalia would be all right. He said, yeah, but we have clans. <laughs> it's like, okay, so we're going to subdivide now. <laughs> so... Anyway, anything else? Oh, I, wanna, oh, I just oh. want to say one thing. If you're, gonna, if you're ever going to wrestle an anaconda, just hold, make sure you hold on to his neck. Thank you. Hey, well, you know, it's you know, really noted. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very, very much. This has been very, uh, I, I love listening to the stories and seeing the photos. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks for coming. Okay, do you guys have time to talk a little bit about if you're away for a month or weeks on an assignment, are you bringing the film back or are you shipping it back and do the editors see it before you, you do? That editing process. Yes, I, I'd, I'd love to talk about that because I, I love anyone who actually knows that there was film. <laughs> <laughs> I dig my, dig myself. <laughs> so um, we we were shooting film and so we did not see the images at the time which was very disconcerting I was used to newspaper work uh, actually before that where I would shoot for the globe and you know rush back to the paper and develop the film and print it myself and rush the prints up to the city desk but when you're working for the geographic you're in the field sometimes for months uh, without seeing any images, and uh, I know it's hard to believe now, uh, but the way they would do it is um, you get you get the film in cans, I, and then um, we would number the rolls as they came out of the camera, and it would um, allow us to sync them with captions that we'd write, and then we were supposed to ship the film back to the geographic every two weeks if we possibly could. And of course, there were x-rays to deal with and heat storing the film was always a problem with heat. I can remember having to, being in places like in Australia where there was no shade whatsoever and you couldn't leave film in a car or it would be destroyed in a matter of very, very little time. And um, digging a hole and then putting the film in the hole and then driving the car on top of it to make sh shade to try to keep it cool. Or if we had ability to keep it in a cooler uh, that was electric, we would do that. But, oh, can I interrupt there for a second? Yeah. Um, I learned to wrap a wet towel around coolers and the evaporation from that kept it cool. Because I was, like you, I was really paranoid about heat. He was the thing that really got it. And then um, it would be shipped back to a team of photo editors. We'd each have a photo editor who would work on our project uh, from beginning to end. And then 
at the time, if you could call in, you could call in and that picture editor would give you a review of the film. Often it was a telex, you know, you'd send a telex, uh, at, you know, and, or get a telex telling you, oh, camera number two isn't working. You know, the last 30 rolls you shot, there's nothing on them at all. And so then it was always a crisis of, you know, would you go back to a place and things like that. And when digital came in, I was a very early adopter. I, um, for, the, for lighting, uh, before that I had a Polaroid camera that I had ad adapted for the back of my cameras and would shoot Polaroids in order to test lighting. And once the first digital cameras uh, came out, the Geographic didn't want to use the digital images because they were inferior to what they could get from film at the time. But I could test situations uh, with a digital camera and see what things looked like before I was shooting with um, shooting with film. And by the time I left, I mean, I got involved toward the end of my career at the Geographic, which is I finished up in about 2006. I started uh, with some other people, started a school. Bob Caputo was involved in it, and Lou Jones was involved in teaching there. That we just decided we would teach all digital all the time. And that made it, it was a very interesting thing to watch to see how students could progress so much more quickly if they could actually see what they were shooting. I mean, we were among the few artists in the world who were working every day without being able to see what we were making. And um, digital just changed all that. I don't, I didn't get the name of the person who asked that question, but I'm curious if that answers your question. Yes, it, uh, it's Ron Palnell, uh, Carrie. Uh -huh. uh, yes, that does, hi, oh, yeah. Um, both of you, great, great uh, presentation. Just as quickie, did you use Kodachrome mostly for the National Geographic? As long as we could, I can yeah. remember Kodak used to send representatives um, pretty regularly during the annual seminars and they would show the latest, greatest films they had. And I can remember at one point, what was it? Kodachrome 2, Kodachrome X, something. Kodachrome we, 64, they reformulated. reformulated I think, yeah. it and it was all red. Well, whatever they did, I can remember, you know, they were, they were very proud. They made this presentation and they said, are there any questions in the room? And the photographers, there was a long silence. And then the first question was, how much of the old stuff can we get before you make the new stuff? And I can tell you, some of those photographers still have some of that film in their freezers. <laughs> but there's nowhere to get it processed anymore. <laughs> I just want to... Uh, jump in here I, I agree completely with what Carrie said about digital and everything but one thing that I I kind of don't like about it is that when it was film and you couldn't see right away what you got at least for me I think I tended to spend longer with us with a person or a subject or whatever I was shooting because I didn't really know what I had and there was always the possibility things could get better um, whereas in the digital age, I, you know, you can look and say, oh, yeah, that'll do. And it's sort of easier to, to just kind of move from one thing to another. But Bob, can you click on, you see the, the picture of the Tibetan monk with the blue sky behind him next to the cheetah cub? This one? No, no, up, up, oh, up, up. Sorry, this guy. Yeah. That's Kodachrome 25. <clears throat> Excuse me, which I shot as often as, as possible is hard because it's, it was so slow, but there ain't no colors like that anywhere. Mm. Especially when the light's coming through the slide as opposed to being, you know, like this. I concur totally. Kodachrome 25 was amazing. 64 yep. gave you a stop and a half more almost. Yep. Probably worth it. Yep, and then we all, <laughs> moved, then we all moved to Fujifilm. <laughs> yep, uh, they were the first to get their E6 going. Yes, exactly. I, I shoot rock and roll. That's all I do. And I got stuck shooting Chuck Berry live. And the only color I had was Kodachrome 25. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> How do you get him to sit still? <laughs> uh, well, it was tough, but it was, uh, I had a 1 4 lens of some sort. So, and he was in a big arena uh, in 1972 in Denver. 
Uh-huh. Anyway, Guttachrome was the best. Did you ever yeah. shoot Ektachrome before Fuji figured out the E6? I did occasionally when I needed a higher ISO, yeah. Higher, yeah, yeah. I shot it for, uh, for tungsten. Yes. Right, tungsten. right. Yeah, remember when we had to like change films? That was weird. <laughs> and all those filters, all those filters. Question from Rebecca, which I don't understand. Did you see that, Bob? What about the photo directly above that with the bird? This one. Oh, yeah. Maybe that's yours, Carrie. This is the story of pre social distancing. Um, this is at a bird market. Again, I was doing a story about Sichuan. And um, during the Cultural Revolution, um, every, every, everything that was socially acceptable seemed to have come to a stop. You weren't allowed to dance and um, had to put on these Mao suits and everything. But there were two things that the Chinese loved that were, um, that were still going on, but secretly. One of them was a bonsai. And in fact, once those restrictions were lifted, came out of hiding 500 year old bonsai plants. But the other one was this love of, uh, of birds, having birds in the house. And Sichuan is most, most famous for their tea houses. There are literally thousands of tea houses where stories are told and people come together, you know, just the opposite of social distancing. People come together and, um, this picture was at a bird swap market where you know people were people who raised birds were selling them or swapping birds and the next picture is inside the tea house you see it there and mm -hmm. this old guy has brought his bird so that the bird can be with other birds and um, <laughs> what they would do is they put the two cages on the table so that the birds could sing to each other. Oh. And um, uh, this was uh, very, very common is that the tea house would have a theme of some sort. And this was the bird market tea house. I just want to interrupt then uh, let people know Ron Panel who was asking those questions and talking about film. Ron, somebody that I've worked with over the years as Ron said, he's a rock and roll photographer. Uh, and just want to let people know that we are working on a gallery talk that uh, hopefully we'll be having sometime in June. So right. uh, kind of getting a little preview here from Ron. Oh, good. good. I can't well, wait, Bob. <laughs> me either. <laughs> well, so if there's, if there's, this would be a good time to wrap this up. Bob, do you have any other comments? No, just how wonderful it was to, to, uh, to do this. And to, I heard stories from you I had never heard before. It was awesome. Well, that's, a, that's amazing. <laughs> I know, just given, <laughs> given how much you talk, yeah. <laughs> well, I want to thank uh, Bob and Carrie very much for sharing their imagery and their time. And if you want to see this most of these images again uh, they are on our gallery page under the national geographic show so you can look at those and uh, we're working on our june newsletter that'll be going out uh, early next week with updates on more events and workshops that we're doing here so i just want to thank you all for tuning in supporting what we're doing here and especially again to uh Bob and Carrie. Thank thanks you for, thanks for organizing this, Bob. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. And next, let's hope that the next time we do this, we can actually be together. Hi there, Rick Ashley. I'm saying hi back to you, too. Oh, hi, Rick. And for those of you, again, <laughs> just talking about what we've been here, uh, Rick, last week, he and Neil Rantoul talked about their show that they had here, and that uh, actually is posted up online on uh, our YouTube channel. That's a very imaging in the gallery upstairs. That's a very cool show about monsters. Right. Well, thank you all again. Really appreciate it. And I'll be well and safe. You too. Everybody. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.